Great. Um, I'll give everybody just like one more minute to, to find their way here. But it's good to know we are we are ready, ready for a panel. Still have a few people trickling in, so. Um, but I think we will we will go ahead and get started. So, good afternoon, everyone, or depending on where you are. Good morning. It's only afternoon on the East Coast, so uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Carrie Racian. I'm an associate professor of public policy at UConn, and I'm also the director of UConn's Arm Center. We'd like to welcome you uh, to the first panel of our four-part series entitled Bearing the Burden. And just as an FYI, we are recording the session and it will be reposted um, on social media and various other outlets. Um, this series, uh, the entire four-part series is co-sponsored by UConn's ARM Center, as well as Brown University's uh, Taubman Center. Um, and I'd like to first recognize my co-organizers, Jennifer Janine, uh, Wendy Schiller, and Caitlin Storsky. Um, also, I'd like to thank Haley Troy, Josh Harden, Michaela Carey, and Melanie Skolnick for all of their work behind the scenes in getting flyers and notifications and recordings and all that kind of stuff um, together so that we can be here today. We really appreciate all of their help. Before I introduce today's panelists, I'd like to simply start by addressing why we're all here today and why this is an important topic. Often, when we talk about gun violence statistics in America, we see some statistics Somewhat like this. This is from the Pew Research Center. Uh, the top green line are suicide rates for 100,000 people in the United States, and the bottom golden line are murder or homicide rates per 100,000 people in the United States. What you see is that over time, both homicide and murder rates have gone up and down. Uh, they are uniquely high for the United States compared to our um, developed country counterparts. Uh, suicide typically um, is higher than homicide rates, though that's not always true, but for the most part, um, that's true. Um, however, the motivation for today's panel and indeed for this series is that we think these statistics often mask women's experience, women's unique experience as it relates to gun um, gun death and frankly injury, but we're, most of these statistics will be surrounding gun death. So we think it's important to first start by saying that women account for about 14% of all gun deaths. But since 2010 in particular, women's gun death rates have increased by about 71%. Um, which is higher than men's increase. Uh, among Black women, the firearm homicide rate has tripled and the firearm suicide rate has doubled. So we're seeing a particularly pronounced increase in gun death rates um, among women, particularly uh, Black women. Women are also more likely to be killed by an intimate partner than anyone else. And over half of intimate partner homicides are committed with a firearm. Moreover, a woman is five times more likely to be murdered when her abuse, when her abuser has a gun. Also, in addition to uh, changes in victimization rates, we think it's also important to consider uh, changes in women's gun ownership rates. Uh, those rates are rising um, higher than other groups, according to uh, statistics collected by Gallup. It's unclear if this um, you know, is in response to uh, women's victimization rates, if it's causing women's increased victimization rates, I'm not sure uh, that we have all of that sorted out just yet, but we do know that women are increasingly uh, purchasing guns more, which could change the dynamic um, of how women uh, show up in these statistics. 
I think this disproportion, and I should also say women and the, the, the point of this series is to talk about the way that women uh, are differentially uh, affected by gun violence over the next, you know, four installments. So, so please uh, know that. But I think that this creates different implications for policies and intervention responses. I think there may be some responses that, that work for sort of general population, uh, but it's also if women are differentially uh, affected by gun violence and we're not talking about the ways in which women are differentially affected by gun violence, then our policies may not be effective for them, uh, may not be protecting them, and we may in fact be missing an opportunity uh, to intervene in this public health crisis as it relates to women. And that's really the motivation uh, for our panel here today. So um, we have an amazing uh, lineup of panelists uh, for you today. We have four um, folks, and I couldn't imagine uh, a better a better group to talk about this problem um, and potential solutions today. Um, I'm going to, uh, it turns out that the order is also alphabetical uh, uh, for our presenters, which is uh, a nice um, feature of what they're going to talk about. But Kristen Hefner will be our first presenter. She's an associate professor of criminal justice at the Citadel. And then Brooklyn Hitchens will um, speak, and she is an assistant professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Maryland College Park, followed by Sierra Smucker. She's a full policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. And finally, we will have April Zioli, who's an associate professor in the Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention at the University of Michigan. Each of the panelists will speak for roughly um, 10 minutes about different aspects um, ranging from uh, domestic violence to um, community gun violence to um, how gun violence differentially affects uh, women of different ages with an emphasis on senior women, and then how um, certain policy tools such as emergency uh, Erpos, emergency, I can never get it right, the red flag laws. Uh, April's gonna, that's why that's April's segment. Um, and how the, that policy tool um, can be sort of applied to women um, and better uh, used uh, to protect women. Then of course, we are going to just open this up for a conversation and for your questions and discussion. So you're welcome to put your questions in the chat feature. Um, you're welcome to put them in there as you um, think about them or save them for later, but I will hold questions and comments until the end. So feel free to enter it in whenever you would like, but just know I'll come back to that after our presenters um, have, have shared all of their information with you. Um, so with that, I am going to just again say thank you for joining us. This is the first of a four-part series. And if you'd like to join us for the others, the link for that will be um, will be in the chat. And additionally, this, this presentation will be recorded and posted. And so if you're unable to stay, or if you would like to forward this to anyone you think would be interested, please absolutely feel free to do that. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Kristen. I'm going to exit my slides here. And Kristen should be able to just go. She is just going to chat with us. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Can everyone hear me okay? So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, firearm violence against women in the context of intimate partner violence. It's really difficult to talk about firearm violence against women without discussing it in the context of intimate partner violence because the two are inextricably linked. So to situate this just a bit, intimate partner violence is a pattern of abusive behaviors by one partner against another to maintain power and control over that person. And we know that women are much more likely to be victims of this type of violence than men are. It's estimated that one in four women experience severe intimate partner violence, and this leads to um, a host of consequences, physical, emotional, psychological, social, economic consequences for women. Intimate partner violence perpetrators often use firearms to maintain power and control over their victims. And firearms really exacerbate this control. Um, firearms increase the control that abusers have over their victims, and they also make deadly outcomes much more common in these instances. To put this in some context, about 4.5 million women have been threatened with a firearm by an abusive partner, 
and over 1 million women have been shot or shot at by an abusive partner. And research solidly documents that the presence of a firearm in intimate partner violence situations significantly increases the risk of intimate partner homicide. It's estimated that about 30 to 60% of all women who are killed are killed by an intimate partner, and over half of women killed by an intimate partner are, are killed with a firearm. In fact, abusers having access to a firearm increases the risk of intimate partner homicide by 500%. There's also some research suggesting that firearms may be more common in households where intimate partner violence occurs. Some colleagues and I um, conducted research in Delaware exploring, among other things, women's experiences with and perceptions of intimate partner violence and firearms bans relating to protection order cases. I'll talk about protection orders um, in a couple minutes. We found that um, a little over one third of the women we surveyed said their abusers had easy access to a firearm. Many of these men were legally prohibited from possessing firearms. And about 15% of the women surveyed had a weapon used against them by an abuser in the past. But threats involving weapons, including firearms, were much more common. And this is consistent with existing research. About 40% of the women we surveyed disclosed that their abusers had threatened them with a weapon, including a firearm. And this is really significant because in the context of intimate partner violence, threats often escalate to physical violence. And importantly, in our study, over 60% of the women believed that their abusers were capable of killing them. And again, we know that intimate partner violence incidents involving firearms are much more likely to result in death than those that don't involve a firearm. So access to firearms by intimate partner violence offenders poses a serious risk to their female partners. And so some people ask, well, what about women arming themselves with a firearm as protection against their abusive partners? Uh, but this isn't supported by research as a protective factor. Women's possession of a firearm does not protect against intimate partner homicide. And in fact, there's some re research that suggests that it can actually increase a woman's risk. And we also hear the argument that um, if, a, if an abuser can't access a firearm, then he'll just find another weapon to kill his abuser or, or to kill his uh, victim. But that's also not supported by data. Firearms simply make deadly outcomes more likely in relationships characterized by intimate partner violence. And one legal remedy for um, survivors are civil protection orders. I mentioned these earlier. Civil protection orders are a legal alternative to the criminal justice system. They are civil orders that are initiated by survivors and um, they're individualized to meet the unique needs and circumstances of survivors. This is really important. This individualized nature of protection orders is important because research solidly documents that intimate partner violence survivors have complex needs. And so tailoring provisions and protection orders is consistent with survivor-centered advocacy and is also a really important part of protecting women. So relevant to our discussion today, judges can prohibit abusers from obtaining or possessing firearms as a part of protection order. And there's research that suggests that laws restricting abusers from purchasing firearms and court orders require, requiring the removal of firearms from abusers can decrease intimate partner homicides. So there's evidence that protection orders can decrease gun-related intimate partner violence incidents. But simply including a firearms provi provision in a protection order is not enough to protect women from this type of violence. There's a lot of inconsistency in the extent to which these provisions are emphasized and enforced. Um, so for example, in our research from Delaware, there was a lot of variation in the extent to which the firearm bans were explained to women in court. Some women received sufficient communication about the ban from judges, um, but others didn't have it explained at all or even felt like judges didn't take it seriously. Some women didn't even know there was a firearms ban in their protection order. So there seems to be a focus on bureaucratic efficiency in terms of getting these cases through the system quickly that undermines some of this process. But taking time to explain firearms provisions is important so that both victims and offenders understand the restrictions that are included in, in protection orders. And we see similar inconsistencies with the enforcement of firearms bans in protection order cases. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that later if there's interest. So as I've illustrated over the past few minutes, firearms pose a very real threat 
to women in abusive relationships, and it's important that the legal system responds consistently and effectively to this threat. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hefner. I appreciate that. And I'm again, we will have time for questions um, after we've heard from all of our panelists. Um, it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Brooklyn Hitchens. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to see you all. I'm going to share my screen um, and show you a PowerPoint or what kind of brief PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I'm big on imagery and color. And so what you'll see is um, these are pictures that I've gathered um, from a lot of my ethnographic work in cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore and Wilmington, Delaware. So um, so yeah, I'll, show, I'll share with you today a snippet of a larger presentation and project on patterns of gun homicide related loss among black women and girls in the streets and in the criminal justice system. And I call it second killings, black women and girls left behind to grieve America's growing gun crisis. All right. So um, in her book, Ghetto Side, um, author Julia Ovi writes, she says, homicide had ravaged the country's, the country's Black population for a century or more, but it was at best a curiosity to the mainstream. The raw agony it visited on thousands of ordinary people was mostly invisible. The consequences were only superficially discussed. The costs seldom tallied. And I'll just say for as much as we quote unquote know about you know, the epidemic of assaultive gun violence in low-income Black communities, we often simultaneously silence the voices of those who are most impacted. And so despite a closing kind of gender gap and victimization risk, women are really still at a greater risk for victimization than we really would expect given their lower levels of offending in comparison to men. And these kind of overarching questions guide much of my work um, as I ask, you know, how does a violent phenomenon that disproportionately injures Black men also harm the lives and well being of Black women? And what can we gain by expanding how we understand gun violence to include the experiences of street identified Black women and girls? And when I say street identified, I'm referring to um, that segment of the Black population that are in closest proximity to the violence, that are in closest proximity um, to the criminal justice system and things of that nature. And, you know, despite this growing literature that, you know, we all contribute to about gun victimization um, in marginalized Black communities, less attention has been paid to the collateral consequences of the families, the peers, and the community members who are really left behind when someone is shot and killed. Um, Low-income Black women and girls really live, or they're not only often left in the shadows in our conversations about gun violence, but they really do live in a complex social world with the threat of violent death and or injury. And as you can see here, um, data on firearm related homicide, um, indicate that Black women experience higher rates of assaultive homicide than do white and Hispanic women and white men. And although um, you guys can see my screen, right? The screen is paused now. Oh, you can see it, right? Okay. <laughs> and although they're less likely to be direct victims than our Black men, they are no less likely to be affected by the bloodshed in their communities. And so, you know, how do we kind of reckon with that? Dr. Hefner, I'm sorry, Dr. Hitchens, just to confirm, I only see your title slide. Is that the slide I'm supposed to be on? Oh, no. Okay. No. So there's a problem. Let's see. <laughs> um, so can you see that? Yes, it's. I can see the presentation. There we go. Yep. Oh, wow. You can see this stuff. Okay. So um, let me just... So you can see them, but I won't go over them again, but you could hear my voice, of course. Um, so here we are. Um, well, now we're back at that first slide. So maybe, do you wanna go on that second slide? So what can you see now? The title the first, slide. The title slide. So you could see them for a minute, but then you couldn't, what? Um, sorry, everyone. We, I think we can't see them when you're in presentation mode. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So maybe I'll just for, for time purposes. Can you see this? You can just yeah. see the burger. Yeah. The, yeah. I, yeah. That's fine. Yes. All right. I'll try to make them a little bigger if I could. Um, maybe not though. Um, that's unfortunate. But I will keep going. And we forge ahead. <laughs> And we forge oh, ahead. Then there we go. Look how big that is. That's big. That's very big now. That's good. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, so here I was. That was about here. And so I was saying, you know, although they're less likely to be direct victims than our Black men, they are really no less um, affected by the bloodshed in their communities. And so I really asked how we reckon with that. And I've examined that very question um, in many cities, as I was saying, like uh, Wilmington, Delaware, Philadelphia, and Baltimore most recently. And these are all cities that have seen an uptick in gun violence involving women in recent years. I'm a criminologist, right? So I study crime and crime rates very closely. Um, we also know that the national homicide clearance rates are really at an all time low for this country, according to the FBI. Um, so in 2020, you know, as homicide numbers surge, or surge in this country, police saw fewer violent crimes um, and the national clearance rate dropped to about 50 percent for the first time ever. And as you can see here, it dropped even more precipitously um, for some neighborhoods or cities hit hardest by gun violence. And now you have a city like Philadelphia, for example, where I'm currently conducting a study um, that's seeing homicide numbers that it really hasn't seen since the 90s and the 80s. So moving on, you know, racial disparities in death and loss indicate that Black Americans really have a cumulative risk of death exposure, a greater cumulative risk of death exposure than whites, which really has corrosive effects on Black families and communities. So racial ethnic identity not only shapes the prevalence of this exposure, but also how Black Americans grieve, process, and how they cope with this exposure. And because they're overrepresented among homicide victims, they're also overrepresented among homicide survivors or similarly co-victims who vicariously you know, experience or witness the loss of a loved one to homicide and survive the experience. Low-income Black women and girls are more often homicide survivors, given that Black households are often female-headed with extended networks and fictive kinships led by women. And as such, Black women and girls are charged with nurturing their homes and their communities in the wake of violent Black death. Though there continues to really be a paucity of studies um, on the, the various levels of suffering that they experience and endure. But my work really argues that it is their experiential knowledge that is truly critical to understanding both the problems and the solutions to urban gun violence. So by way of an example, because I'm an ethnographer, um, recently I spoke to two street identified black women in Philadelphia both of whom have experienced their fair share of loss. And one begins to tell me a story of the time one of her close neighbors was shot and killed right on her block. She ran outside, you know, seconds after the shots rang out and she joined her neighbors in this kind of collective shock at discovering the grisly scene. So she and I continue to discuss the incident and I ask her, I say, so, you know, how, how long did it take for, you know, firefighters or city workers to come and clean up the mess, you know, the bloodshed? Um, I know they're supposed to clean the sidewalks and stuff like that after. And I remember her pausing and she wrinkled her eyebrows. She kind of looked at me quizzically and she said, they clean it up. And then she shook her head and she replied, no, we clean it up. And what she really effectively revealed to me was a really common practice among Black women who were in close proximity to the streets and the ensuing bloodshed, um, really that in the, sh in the face of structural violence and disinvestment, Black women are not only tasked with the unequal burden of loss, but also the unequal psychological, socio-emotional, and physical labor of managing this loss as community as community residents and leaders. 
And um, this photo here was taken actually by the Philadelphia Inquirer by a woman that goes by the name of Tink, who is, as you can see, is effectively cleaning a biohazard outside of her door. And so I'll stop and I'll say that Black women literally clean up the actual and the figurative messes of gun violence in their communities every single day. And my work, my larger work argues that it affects them. And I examine the different ways that it affects their outcomes and the way that they see the world. So I'll stop there. Thank you um, for that. Uh, that's gonna, that's, um, that was very powerful. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Uh, Sarah Smucker uh, will be um, talking to us next. So I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight her and um, Sierra, please. Hi everyone, thank you so much. And um, thank you uh, for that presentation. That was very moving. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work as it, as it emerges. Um, I am Sierra Smucker, I'm from the Rain Corporation. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Carrie, for inviting me. I'll pretty much do anything you ask me at this point. So I hope I hope you keep them coming. Can everyone see my slides? Okay, great. So I'm here to focus specifically on another group of victims of gun violence who are also sometimes overshadowed by other conversations around victimization, and that is older women. So specifically, I'm talking about women over 65 in this presentation. So just some basics, you know, we, we talk a lot about violence, as Carrie mentioned at the beginning, um, gun violence is sort of talked about in these broad terms of people being impacted. Um, and it's typically thought of as a problem of young people. So when, even when we think about IPV victims or intimate partner violence victims, we might typically think of a younger woman with children trying to escape a violent relationship. And my work actually historically has focused mostly on that group of women and their intersection with gun violence and policy. But I recently started to work on issues of elder mistreatment and abuse and policies that support older women who are facing domestic violence, potentially longstanding domestic violence, and are trying to leave that relationship and find almost no services or policies or resources to help them escape. Um, specifically, I've been focusing on violence and firearms. Sarah, and, you and froze women. just a, a little bit. Would you mind oh. to repeat like... Specifically, sure. I've been working on, and then that's a that's when you froze. Okay, am I back? Yes, okay, thank you are back. Um, so specifically, I've been working on a project related to older women who are victims of domestic violence in need of emergency housing. So you know, the typical shelter model is most commonly built around a younger woman who may have children who needs emergency housing. Older women have complex needs that are very different from that younger uh, counterpart. So that led me to start to think about how gun violence also impacts older women in a potentially different way than younger women who are in violent family situations. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about those avenues of research. It's relatively understudied, so I'm not going to be talking about specific research that I've done, but I, it's stuff I've hoped to do. And um, if anyone on this call is interested, I would love to talk more about it. Um, so again, older women do represent a relatively small portion of women killed by firearms, but their firearms are absolutely a part of their lives um, as a threat and as a risk to their livelihood. Um, there is a tendency as people age to also increase their options for self-defense. And this is typically talked about around men. So men, older men are more likely to own firearms and the reason for owning them is typically self-defense. But women live in households with men who buy guns and some women buy guns for the same reason. Um, so we know that about 45%, almost half of people over 65 live in a house with a firearm, which is the most of any age group. So again, older women are typically understudied in this area, but they are at risk of firearm related homicides. And, you know, some of this is just me doing up to date um, whiskers um, analysis, but it does seem like 
older women are at risk of firearm violence and potentially at a higher rate than women uh, younger than 65. Um, we also know that homicide suicides are common among in instances where older women are killed by an intimate partner. Um, there's sort of a narrative around that about you know, maybe assisted suicide or, you know, something where people are just ready to to move on to the next to the next stage. Um, but when you look at the details of these cases, there are a, the vast majority of them are intimate partner related and it's not consensual. Um, there is some anecdotal evidence that these murder suicides are increasing among this age group. More research is needed in that area, but um, it is one of the risks that women, women older women face um, from homis, from firearms. There's also some growing interest in violence and threats in nursing homes. So resident to resident aggression has always been an issue in nursing homes, but with the aging population increasing dramatically and the baby boomers being one of the highest firearm owners um, in the United States, there is increasing concern around people bringing firearms into nursing homes. There's no broad regulation for this practice. If a nursing home is a private nursing home, they can ban guns on that basis, but um, there's no broader state policies that regulate this specifically. And there's a lot of concern about people who may progress um, towards dementia or have some cognitive decline and their ownership of a firearm in a in a high in a dense um, living situation. So a California law now requires assisted living communities that allow guns on their premises to have them, you know, unloaded, centrally stored and locked in a gun safe compartment. But this type of law is relative, is it is new, it's unique. So I'm definitely watching to see if these types of laws take effect in more places as an understanding of this risk uh, materializes. So we also, most of us on this call likely know that suicide is also a very um, high risk factor for death among the older population. Um, this is typically talked about around white men who are of much higher risk of suicide as they age. Um, there's a lot of reasons people have hypothesized for this and studied. Um, and, you know, to Brooklyn's point in her last presentation, the this high rates of suicide among older men is also going to impact older women who are in their vicinity, potentially their partners. Um, although there's there is a higher correlation between suicide at an older age and being divorced or separated, that doesn't mean that the the person who left that person is not going to be affected by that, by the person taking their life. So that's another way that older women are maybe uniquely impacted by types of gun violence that are so common in the U.S. And then again, as Brooklyn was talking about, you know, as, as America ages, um, there's just going to be a longer standing history of people being exposed to the trauma of gun violence, whether or not they were actually involved, but they are, there's going to be an aging population who has this trauma and we need to develop tools to help them cope with it um, as they get older. Um, and then another issue that I'm really interested in that has been talked about in some of the new research around women potentially increasing their firearm ownership is around inheriting firearms. So when uh, a man of the, uh, in, the, in a household dies who maybe owns more than five firearms, um, the woman who's living with him probably inherits those firearms and becomes a gun owner. And it's unclear to me whether there are good resources in place to teach someone who sort of accidentally is now a gun owner how to safely store those guns, how to keep themselves safe, especially as they age and again, reach some um, point of potential cognitive decline that can also be correlated with um, suicide risk and other types of issues that can increase the risk of firearm uh, misuse or injury. So again, just to summarize some of these uh, open threads, um, there's definitely a need to advance research on older couples, firearms, and violence. Um, I've spoken to a few researchers who are working on a firearm retirement plan. So thinking about ways that older people can sort of divest from their firearm 
ownership in a way that makes them feel empowered and safe and keeps the community um, more broadly safe from those firearms. Um, and then also thinking about unique protections and resources for older women who experience um, intimate partner violence or domestic violence. So there's also a unique issue among older women that they could experience domestic violence or they're more likely to experience domestic violence at the hands of someone other than their partner. So I'm imagining a, an older woman who's living with their adult children. We see a lot of elder abuse cases. Actually, the majority of them are cases where a older child is abusing the older parent. And thinking about ways that, you know, civil protection orders and ERPOs can, and sorry, April's going to talk about ERPOs after me, but extreme risk protection orders can be accessed more easily by older women who might not have grown up with these terms or this policy, might not have had the time to digest what those types of policies could provide them in their um, in their current situation. So with that, I will also just do a moderately shameless plug that's hopefully helpful of some of the tools that RAND offers for people interested in study, studying gun violence. All of this is free on our website. So we have a really massive and detailed state firearm law database, which attempts to capture a lot of nuance around state policies related to firearms. Um, so any anyone who's on the call interested in doing research on the impact of those policies, that's a really helpful database that is free to download from our website. We also have papers on um, the strength of evidence around the policy impact of different policies listed in that state firearm database, estimates of gun ownership across different groups. Um, and I recently finished a paper on how to use the NICS background check system for research, um, which is a really rich data source, but is, is tricky to use. So if anyone was interested in that, that's also available. So I will close there and pass to uh, Dr. Zioli. Thank you, Sierra. I appreciate that. Um, one thing I will mention as a resource as you were uh, chatting, so uh, Dr. Emmy Betts and her team recently um, released a, a tool for firearm inheritance. Um, and, and so that is available and I'll try to find the link, but it does exist and it's designed to sort of help think about how to have conversations around firearm inheritance for people who, who for whom that applies. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Zioli. Thank you so much. And as the last speaker, I get to say that I've really enjoyed hearing everybody else speak. These have been fascinating presentations. Um, so I'm going to explain extreme risk protection orders. There we go. Now, extreme risk protection orders are civil court orders. They're not criminal. They're civil court orders that temporarily suspend a person's right to purchase and possess a gun. They are used for the purpose of responding to cases in which people are in crisis or are going to harm others with guns and preventing that from happening. So these are you know, for people who legally own guns, and it's the way to remove guns from their access so that they don't harm themselves or harm others. So this really is about imminent risk of harm or emergencies. And currently 19 states and the District of Columbia have extremist protection order laws. And my state, Michigan, just introduced an extremist protection order bill. We'll see how that uh, goes in the legislature, um, you know, but we may get 20 states in the District of Columbia. Now, ERPOs are the civil court pro process and they mirror in many ways domestic violence restraining orders. A petition has to be filed for an ERPO. Before that happens, dangerous behaviors have to be detected by somebody. So somebody can state that they're um, suicidal, that they're planning suicide, or they may attempt suicide, 
Or uh, it could be a situation of intimate partner violence where an intimate partner violence threatens to, or an intimate partner violence perpetrator threatens to shoot their partner or somebody threatens a mass shooting, for example. But that risk of future harm has to be detected by somebody. And then an ERPO petition needs to be filed with the civil court. In general, in every state, law enforcement can petition for these orders. And in some states, I think 13 of the states, um, family members and intimate partners can directly petition the civil court. And then there are a few other categories of people in a small number of states think that can petition, like healthcare providers can petition in Maryland, for example. So you petition for the ERPO and you include the evidence that you, know, you have to suggest that this person is at imminent risk of harming themselves or others. And then the judge will look at that evidence in an ex parte situation, meaning that this is before the person who the order would be against knows about the petition, unless somebody told them, um, and has not yet had the opportunity to be in court. The ex parte stage is that quick emergency stage. So the judge will issue an order or deny an order in that ex parte stage. Regardless, it could go to a final hearing, and that's where the person who the order would be against, termed the respondent, has the opportunity to go and to either argue against the extremist protection order, or which happens fairly commonly, they can stipulate to the order. They can agree that it should be in place. If that happens, um, the order is in place for about a year, but it differs by state. In Illinois, it's in place for six months. In most states, it's in place for one year. In California, it can extend past one year. A judge can issue it for two years or I think up to three years. During that time that somebody is under an order, they can make a motion to terminate the order. It can either be terminated or the judge can deny the motion. And then it will go to you know that one year mark, and then it can be extended if there's new evidence that the person is still a risk to themselves. Once it's in place, law enforcement generally go to remove the firearms that that person already possesses um, from their residence or wherever they are keeping them. What we know so far is that extremist protection orders have been used in response to suicide risk. In fact, the majority of um, petitions that we know about are issued for suicide risk. And often there's a risk of suicide and harm to others. Those things often co-occur, though we tend to think of them as separate things. Uh, and research suggests that they might be effective in reducing suicide risk. Uh, research at both the individual level and the ecological level, so the state level, suggests that they are associated with reductions in suicide. Now I'm going to get to the gender part. You've been wondering when that's going to come in. Um, so there is demographic information in studies on you know the gender of respondents. You can see here, we have uh, the state or you know, the county that the petitions are from, the gender breakdown of who the order or petition is against, and the citation. Now, in Indiana, we see that 81% of these orders are against males and 19% against women. This actually you know, mirrors suicide rates you know, in the United States. So the suicide rate for men is about 20 per 100,000. And for women, it's about five per 100,000. So if, if we think about suicide risk, that Indiana distribution is pretty close you know, to, to what that breakdown is. Now, of course, ERPOs are not just for suicide risk, but we also know that men commit more intimate per, interpersonal violence as well. So these breakdowns of, you know, many fewer 
females to males you know, seem about right. Um, I want to call out this study. Uh, it's a six-state study, and it's specific to mass shooting threats. And in that study, I was one of the authors, we found that 7% of these mass shooting threats were made by women and 93% by men. And that is across California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Maryland, and Washington. And I want to talk a little bit more about those mass shooting threats. Now, we looked at over 6,700 ERPO petitions across those six states. And we found that about 10% of them were for these multiple victim or mass shooting threats. And we categorized them by type of mass shooting threats. And I want you to pay attention to this named target category. But first, I'll just give a brief rundown of what each category is. Maximum casualty threats are the threats where someone indicates that they really want to shoot as many people as possible. You know, so those are the threats against K through 12 schools, against grocery stores, against pharmacies, um, you know, those types of places, public places. Named target threats are threats against specific individuals and maybe their families or, or people that they know or live with them. Implicit threats, which made up 12% of the threats, are when the, the individual didn't come out and say, I'm going to shoot X number of people, I'm going to shoot at whatever location, but maybe they had a gun in their hand and pointed it at a number of people at a park, for example. That was one of our cases. And then we have conditional threats. Those are if-then threats. Um, a common example of this was somebody trying to get prescription medication from a healthcare from a from a pharmacy, where they'd say, "If you don't give me the oxycontin, I am going to shoot this place up." So if then, contextual threats are when it's only qualifying as this mass shooting threat because of the number of people who would be shot. An example of this is a woman who was annoyed by the noise the neighbor children were making in the yard. And so she exited her house with a gun and threatened to shoot them if they didn't shut up. And there happened to be enough children there that it would have been considered a mass shooting if she had actually shot them. And then response to first responders are cases in which something was going down already. You know, maybe it was a suicide risk. A lot of them were intimate partner violence episodes occurring, so physical assaults. And police officers arrived on the scene and then it became a mass shooting threat as the person who was suicidal or who was committing intimate partner violence you know, said, if the police come in here, or if the police even put one foot on this porch, I'm going to start shooting everybody. So really, a lot of these were about intimate partner violence, where the abuser wanted to continue abusing their partner and did not want the police to be involved. But let's look at that named target threat. Um, the named target threats were generally about intimate partner violence. So these were would have been considered family mass shootings if they had occurred. 49% of the named people were intimate partners. And then their children as well um, were included in these threats and other family members often too. Uh, law enforcement were you know, sometimes named targets if they were they had a specific beef with certain law enforcement um, and people at businesses. So a waiter if they didn't appreciate at a restaurant, for example. But this is where um, the intimate partner violence you know really comes in, and we see um, that most of these targets of name target intimate partner cases were women. You know, this this is about threatening 
female intimate partners, it's extensions of intimate partner violence. And the extremist protection orders are being used to protect them in these cases. In fact, in states where civilians could petition for extremist protection orders, so not just law enforcement petitioners, when we saw intimate partners petitioning, it was generally for intimate partner violence. But extremist protection orders are really new. Uh, most of the states that have them passed them after 2016. And so we don't know a whole lot um, about them beyond initial descriptive work and some of those few studies on suicide, which does associational work. So things that we should really start looking at are to what extent they're used in conjunction with or in place of domestic violence restraining orders, because you can get both, um, you know, and sometimes a domestic violence restraining order doesn't include a firearm restriction. So do people supplement with an extreme risk protection order? Or do people really just want the gun gone, you know, when their partner abuses them and don't want to move to that restraining order that might also prevent them from living in the house and, you know, seeing their children and all of those things. So how are survivors of intimate partner violence doing this? And to what extent are extremist protection orders used by law enforcement or prosecutors in cases of intimate partner violence? Unlike domestic violence restraining orders, extremist protection orders can be petitioned for by law enforcement and they don't need the survivor of intimate partner violence to agree that there should be an extremist protection order. So how is that scenario playing out? And are the voices of survivors being heard and appreciated? Um, it's an open question. So uh, I'm doing some research to try to find out and hopefully other people are also doing research to to find out because we need to know more about how these tools are being used and how we can use them optimally to save lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zioli and, and to all of our presenters. Um, I really appreciate Dr. He Drs. Hefner, Hitchens, Mucker, and Zioli. Um, all of those wonderful remarks and presentations. So as promised, we're gonna move into the um, q and I have some questions in the comment box and so I'm gonna start with one of those um, from Dr. Schiller, but you should also feel free to uh, raise your hand and I'll, I'll recognize you. Um, you can um, unmute yourself when, when you're recognized and just remute yourself when it's appropriate and so we don't get any background noise, but um, but I'm happy to let you ask your own question. Uh, Dr. Schiller, would you like to start with your question? Um, sure. So uh, I'm gonna go uh, just my first, my I have a couple of questions. So I'm just gonna ask uh, Dr. Hefner and then we can see if anybody else has any questions. So um, Dr. Hefner, um, you know, in our work, um, Dr. Sorsky and I's work, we've come across some anecdotal evidence um, from judges who have been quoted as saying they don't want to put police officers at risk in ordering them to execute a warrant to get a firearm from a domestic abuser. And there's also that Georgia state study. I haven't found another one, but we haven't found another one yet. But a Georgia state study that said 25% of law enforcement officers who are injured or killed every year are, done, are, are serving a domestic violence warrant or answering a domestic violence call. So what do you think of that justification that judges are making that, you know, when they want to justify um, not issuing an order to um, for a firearm removal? Because uh, we know it's, as you know, you've been you talked about that judges in a lot of states have the option of issuing this warrant or in very few states, they're mandated to do it. We have, you know, Louisiana, I think, um, uh, Dr. Storch, can correct me, you know, first mandated it and then revoked the mandate and then made it optional. So what are your thoughts on that, on that rationale by judges? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so like you said, domestic violence incidents are dangerous, not just to the victim, especially if there's a firearm, but bystanders as well. And that includes first responders, including law enforcement. These um, 
calls for service are notoriously dangerous for law enforcement. And again, just the 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 presence of a firearm makes that even more dangerous. Um, <clears throat> and you're right, judges can decide what to include in the protection order um, that they're granting. Um, maybe they're including the firearms ban, maybe they're not. Um, you know, there is evidence that protection orders can protect women against this type of violence. And it's essential that judges include firearms ban in protection order if we really want to um, protect women, but they have to be enforced as well. There are a lot of barriers, a lot of barriers to enforcing protection orders generally, but also um, in terms of the firearms ban specifically. So the barriers are that courts are not forcing offenders to surrender their firearms. Um, there's a lack of tracking about whether an offender has surrendered their firearms. Um, some states don't have the resources to store the firearms that are seized from offenders. And so while protection orders are, they're seen as, they're, they're an alternative, they're a civil alternative to the criminal justice system. We really have to have cooperation between the civil system and the criminal system if we're going to enforce them effectively. Um, so I, I think judges need to include firearms bans and protection orders if we're going to effectively protect women, but we have to be able to enforce these orders. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up to Kristen, if you don't mind? Can I jump in? Um, so, so I'm just wondering, how do you, how do you think kind of the, the underground illegal gun market like complicates all of that? So complicates the enforcement, uh, but also just the, the sheer proliferation of guns and then not being able to track them and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely um, complicates things um, when, when there are underground guns or guns that are obtained illegally. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of knowledge around um, increasing legislation around this to be able to track them better. And the more tracking we have, um, hopefully the fewer um, underground firearms we'll have. And, and so, you know, hopefully including a legislative kind of response to firearms more generally is essential as well. I just wanted to, to build on that. I don't write, quite have a question, but it, it's always been an interesting overlap and interest to me that police officers and women are both at risk from this gun. And one way, um, though it doesn't totally address what um, the underground firearms market, one way to at least strengthen that system is to make sure background checks are effective. And a lot of these, we know a lot of abusers actually are barred from owning firearms and, and yet still have access to them. So that that seems like a place of agreement where if we could figure out how to make sure people who are prohibited don't end up with guns and then don't have them when the domestic violence happens, we could all be safer. So just... Not a question, but it, it came to me. Yeah, and the research we did in Delaware, these men had easy access to firearms. So if they didn't have a firearm in their house, well, they could get one from their parents or their friends um, or someone they're really close to. So even if they gave up their own firearms, they a lot of them still had easy access to firearms. Thank you. Um, for, for that exchange. Are there other questions? Um, again, you can feel free to raise your hand or I can um, see if one of our panelists has a question. Uh, I have more questions for each of the panelists. So I don't want to hog it though, but I could start off with, uh, with a question for Dr. Hitchens if you want. Go ahead. Um, so Dr. Hitchens, what um, do we know what the correl uh, two two I just, one I just thought of one I wrote down what are the correlations between the rate of firearm death of black women and population density um socioeconomic levels and geography urban rural suburban um and what do you think uh should be or is a current policy in place or should be in place that could specifically address this issue for black women um, and uh, is there something that we're not tailoring, that we're not thinking about, that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about domestic violence and firearms for Black women in particular? And it, it, it comes to mind, you know, we've been searching for a study other than Megan Condon's study on dual arrests and why 
um, African American women are much less likely to call the police for domestic violence. And if they do, they get dual arrested. They get arrested at the same time in much higher rates than white women. Um, so just wondering about the, the sort of systematic failures for black women in particular, and then your thoughts on any solutions or anything we should be thinking about. Wow, that's a big, that's a, yeah, those are really, <laughs> good, really good questions. Thank you for asking them. Um, I know that gun violence as it relates to like the assault of violence for black women is most chronically, right, in low income, you know, the most distressed black communities. Um, I don't know the numbers for rural, uh, the experiences of uh, Black women who live in rural areas, but that would be an interesting kind of next step for me to kind of look at that a little bit more broadly. Um, but we know, we know, we know that in situations of concentrated disadvantage, in situations, you know, of dire poverty in some cases, the, the violence is going to be higher. And we're seeing that, you know, across the country. I'll say though, um, related to like the the implications and the solutions like i know to your point yes there have been systematic failures for black women they often fall through the cracks in so many different ways even the policies that we um implement often don't serve them it needs to be something wrap around right because you have this reality wherein you have so many women who have lost someone already um that also need things um but then also preventing further violence from happening to the woman or to um, her loved one. I know on the other side of it, so as it relates to the, the trauma post-incident, very few cities even offer services for, for victims, like um, whether it's uh, financial services of helping, you know, low-income people, low-income folks pay for funerals, whether it's, um, you know, kind of trauma-informed services and uh, therapy post-incident, um, I've seen one example in Baltimore. They had a, kind of have a center that I've, I've I've frequented, but most cities do not have a trauma informed center for folks to go to after they lose a loved one. And so, as a result, you see the uptick um, in violence and retaliatory violence because people have nowhere to cope or to place it. So, there's a lot there. And yeah, that was one of my questions for you, which was what kind of um, post traumatic event post-loss services might be valuable for victims, but it sounds like we might not know if they're not being offered. But do you have any recommendations for, or, or idea about what kind of services policymakers might try to implement first or as sort of a first order effort? Yeah, I guess if you think about it as the upstream and downstream, like the, the big macro level stuff, in my opinion, if you're not going to address the socioeconomic situations of a neighborhood, right, you're going to still see these disparate numbers and these tragedies. That's the first thing. And we often skip that part. We're like, oh, yeah, we know. But that's the really big part, right? Um, but also understanding why people are getting involved in the violence is important, too. So women, Black women sometimes play this dual role in urban communities where they can sometimes aid in the escalation of the violence, but then also be the glue in helping hold communities together. Um, and so in that way, they really have the answers to solving the violence because they're kind of on both sides of the continuum. Um, so it's this kind of combination of kind of community-based efforts, like investing in the community-based efforts that are already existing. Oftentimes they are cash-strapped and, and don't have much funds to even kind of scale up in the way that they'd like to. Um, but, but also being in close contact with the people who are most affected and asking them what they need. Thank you. And um, we'll take a question from Caitlin and then we'll take the question from April. This is really also amazing and so informative, right? So I'm thinking, Dr. Dickens, as you're talking about, um, you know, the, you know, asking the people what they need and the different you know, programs that would be beneficial to them. You know, I think about we're starting to dig in now into grants, right? And I'm thinking like, how often are pe these people asked, right, about what would be best for you and what would be the best kind of grant, you know, to alleviate or help your community uh, in these ways? So, um, you know, I'm just you're getting me to start to think about that and, you know, what, what the government can do to kind of influence them. Um, I'm also starting, I was also thinking about going back to the judges, right? Um, about like the capacity, right, for judges to be able to do anything or want to do something. Um, and, you know, right now we have a survey in the field to judges across the United States. Um, and so far, about a third of them say that they uh, have absolutely no follow up 
when uh, they issue a uh, you know an order of protection and they say that someone can't have a gun uh, as part of that order of protection. And I'm just curious as to whether I kind of have an idea, <laughs> um, but I'm just curious as to whether or not everyone thinks that that is related to them personally not wanting to follow up, saying that they did it and well, it's there. Or not just knowing that it's not going to be even possible administratively to do that, um, um, which again is like a hard hurdle to get over. Uh, and, or if the law is just not specific enough to right, say to them, like, when you say that you have to remove a firearm in this situation, you have to do so and so far follow. So I'm just curious about where we think in this mechanism, right, the problem is. Is it at the judge? Is it at the law? Right. Um, I'm just curious what everyone thought. I think a part of that is that our, our systems are so siloed, they don't talk to one another. And like I said before, to be able to enforce protection orders at all, we have to have buy-in and cooperation from both the civil system and the criminal system. Because, you know, civil protection orders are civil orders with potentially criminal penalties. And so when we have these two separate systems that don't really work together and don't really talk to one another, um, we will never be able to enforce these orders. So I think training for judges is a part of it, but it's a much larger issue. One you know, of the big um, barriers, and there are a lot of barriers with enforcing protection orders, is that they aren't legally enforceable until an abuser has been served. And there are a lot of barriers to serving um, people. In some jurisdictions, the victims must arrange themselves for the abuser to be served, and you can see how that would be a huge barrier. There's one study that um, noted a non-service rate of um, as high as 91% for protection orders. And so before we can even enforce a protection order, abusers have to be legally notified that a protection order has been granted. And this is not an easy, quick, straightforward process. And so some of the, the accountability does lie with judges. I do think that judges um, need some additional training on the dynamics of intimate partner violence, um, the um, purpose of protection orders, um, the, uh, you know, enforcement of protection orders, but also there needs to be a lot of coordination, a lot more coordination between civil courts and the criminal justice system. Yeah, and just to add on to Kristen's point, I mean, in jurisdictions that do require victims to arrange personal service, personal service is expensive. It can cost around $100 and $150 to, to pay for personal service. Um, and so that's a, you know, if if we're thinking about uh, women with limited financial means, that is that that could be prohibitive in and of itself. So um, another um, element to add there. All right, um, Dr. Zioli. You're muted. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm good at Zoom. Um, I, I wanted to touch base on uh, what Dr. Hitchens was saying, and and then and then I can uh, take the comment that just came in from the Canadian viewer. Um, you know, so much of my research is on domestic violence restraining orders and firearm restrictions, and we did a study where we looked at the effectiveness of these laws for intimate partner homicide in the white population and in the black population. And we found that there were associated significant reductions in intimate partner homicide in the white population, but not in the black population. And I presented these results in Chicago and, you know, Illinois was kind of one of the states when I dug deeper in, in, in the model that, that was really showing that it, it wasn't working um, to prevent Black intimate partner homicide. And I asked them, so what do you, what do you think? What's the deal here? And, and they were pretty unanimous and immediate in, in saying it's the illegal guns. You know, it, it doesn't really matter if even if law enforcement go and, and remove guns that they have, they can they can get more. And, you know, this, this does lead to, you know, more creative thinking about how taking care of illegal guns, you know, can also be an intimate partner homicide and violence intervention, um, you know, and that, you know, 
for some populations, these these laws that we're passing are they're not going to be the primary way, you know, or or even potentially, you know, a, 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 an effective, a really great way to reduce intimate partner homicide. And, and we might have to be more community focused and, you know, working more on community violence interventions or other creative in- interventions to keep Black women safe. Um, that's just a comment. And then the Canadian, uh, for those in the chat or in, on the thing who haven't heard very, very briefly, the Supreme Court ruled last summer that to be constitutional, a modern day firearm restriction had to be significantly uh, rel- similarly, uh, relevantly similar, that's the phrase, relevantly similar to a firearm restriction that was in place at the time of our founding, or maybe possibly around the time the 14th Amendment was passed. And domestic violence was not a crime when our country was founded. There were no laws uh, against domestic violence really until the the 1880s. And it was not, it was just not a problem. You know, that was, it was a problem, but it was not viewed as a public problem. So no, we didn't prohibit abusers from having guns in 1791. Um, Ergo, the Fifth Circuit ruled, we can't do it now. Many of us think that's really flawed reasoning and that we shouldn't be held to the misogyny and everything else, you know, from the time of our founding, the racism, the, you know, um, genocide, the everything that was horrible about the 17th, 18th century, that we shouldn't be held to those in our modern understanding of safety and protection. But we'll see. Yeah, and um, for uh, we did discuss how we might uh, grapple with Bruin on this call, and we decided it was a very, very large topic, though it would definitely come up and we would welcome questions on it, but we will um, try to grapple with that some more in future uh, installments of this series because it is a really large topic that obviously disproportionately uh, is going to affect women. Uh, Jen, Dr. Deneen. Hello. Um, I have a follow-up question for Dr. Zioli um, and really anybody um, who might know of this work could answer it, but you were just discussing the disproportionate impact or effectiveness of ERPO on different populations in the United States. And you showed the slide that looked at race of, um, I'm sorry, gender of respondent, right? Not necessarily race. I was wondering if there have been any studies, and I know it's it's a new area, but that look at um, ERPOs that maybe were, um, I'm not sure the appropriate term, but overruled or or stayed, and and any sense of um, the role that the evaluator or the system may have. So so illegal guns may be part of it, but structural expectations over who's dangerous. Um, over, you know, misogyny, race, and and those things. I'm wondering if there's any evidence to the extent that they might play a part in this. So far, um, the vast majority of extremist protection order petitions are granted, upwards of 90%, probably. And the main difference we're seeing in whether they're being granted is between whether it's a law enforcement officer that petitions for them and whether it's a civilian that petitions for them. Civilians are much less likely to have their order granted. And we think that's because they don't know how to fill out these legal forms and they don't know what counts as evidence and how to present it um, you know, in a way that would meet statutory standard. Um, but we haven't thus far found any uh, you know, big difference by race, though I'm going to throw the caveat in there that often petitions by state don't include a field for race. So we don't always know. Um, and instead of whether they're being ordered by race, I 
think we need to start looking at, and I don't know how to do this in a study, but we need to start looking at whether they're being petitioned for differentially by race. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sierra? I just have a quick follow-up question for um, Dr. Zioli. Um, so my work obviously is looking at whether older women can use, which types of policy interventions are going to be best for older women. And um, one of my concerns is that they might not know about ERPOs. And I'm wondering if you have a sense of who knows about how to use these how, and how they find out. I know, you know, a lot of them only law enforcement officials and people who would have knowledge of them can use them, but there are a lot that are coming out that are supposed to be accessible to family members, um, acquaintance, people who know the person. So I'm wondering if uh, your thoughts on that and, and how that's going. I think it's really hard to alert the public to these things in a way that they will really recognize and understand the appropriate mm -hmm. use um, of these unless they follow on the heels of a huge mass shooting where everybody's paying attention. You know, so in Florida, even though only law enforcement can petition, they passed their law right after the mass shooting in Parkland. And we see the greatest number of petitions from Florida. Um, I think it is our first responders, um, you know, so law enforcement, but also including you know, social workers and, you know, public health nurses and, you know, people that those who are in crisis, including older adults, so maybe geriatricians, um, mm -hmm. you know, people that they go to that can recognize a need for an extremist protection order and tell them about it, um, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe petition themselves or call law, law enforcement themselves if it's a suicide risk and the person doesn't want to give up their gun. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think this really, really rests on first responders instead of like public information campaigns because okay. billboard's not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's fair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one group that sort of sits at the intersection, um, of both Dr. Zioli and Dr. Smucker's work and presentations are sort of the mother of the female intimate partner, right? So very often um, in an intimate partner situation, a woman may go back to her own, to her own mother, to her family, et cetera, in lieu of a shelter. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when you read about an intimate partner, um, homicide. Sometimes the wife is shot as is her mother, right? Mm -hmm. um, and her mother is someone that by most orders of protection would not be able to, to get an order of protection on her own because she does not have a domestic relationship with the abuser. She might be able to get a domestic violence, a, a, excuse me, an ERPO. She might be able to file under ERPO. And I think that may be um, in the substitution that you were talking about um, April, as well as sort of thinking about the ways that women are sort of a safety net, a social safety net uh, across a lot of different uh, contexts, um, a tool that we might see um, uh, affording them some potential protection there. Um, Wendy. Um, hi, I have a, a question for, um, for Dr. Schmucker. So in your work on rural, um, rural uh, death and I IPV and the role of guns, do we have any sense of people VA 65? Um, again, um, I added rural. So what our breakdown is geographically and whether you know, this is more predominant in less uh, dense population communities. And also, is there any uh, follow-up study on um, ethnic, you know, ethnic socially constructed race um, in different communities, given how diverse, particularly in, in our older population, we're seeing a lot of, of gun violence now in California committed against, but also by older Asian Americans. So, so wh where do we think you, you want to go with that as you move forward in the research in terms of those, those categories? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. So all really good questions. I don't think we have good answers yet. And I think that is one of the things I'm, I'm focusing on is really getting a picture of what this type of violence looks like at an older age, where it takes place, 
Is it in places where we see a lot more older people retiring to, or are, is it more rural? Um, I think there is going to be, I, I anticipate there will be differences, but I'm not sure yet. So I don't want to speak to it too clearly, but that is definitely where I'm going is getting that landscape mapped out and figuring out where um, the, the greatest threats are, um, who is posing them. Is it you know, our more typical situation with an intimate partner, um, or is it another family member? Um, and, you know, we have seen some of these, at least a few mass shootings in the last few years have started with domestic violence, but it has been the person's mother or the person's mother-in-law who is the first person um, who is attacked. So, you know, I think just thinking about that the, the position of older women in society. And I think, you know, Carrie is also speaking to this, you know, who's, who is the, the, where, where does the older woman go? Whose mother is likely gone when she's in a situation that she fears for her life. Um, I think these women are going to be more likely to be stuck in that environment, caring for a grandchild who is acting in a way that scares her, um, but feeling in incredibly responsible for them because she is this maternal figure. And I think that's different than um, the, the intimate partner situation, um, maybe not far off, but I think these older women might be less likely to even seek help because they feel um, like they are responsible and society is telling them you are responsible for this human. Um, it's, it's your job to take care of this, not, you know, not to bring in law enforcement. So anyway, that was a very broad and rambly answer to your question, but, um, I think there's a lot here, uh, that is yet to be explored. So I will, I'll keep you posted as I, as I do explore it, but I think your question is definitely the one that's guiding me right now. Thank you. We have time for one more question. If anybody has one more question they they have been thinking about or wanting to ask. Okay, well, if not, um, again, please um, thank our panelists um, with me. Thank you so much. This was really great and very thought provoking and a great way to kick off um, our series. Um, Haley has posted in the chat the link to RSVP to future seminars. Um, they are on the fourth Wednesday of the month at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and our next panel is legislative responses to firearm violence against women. Um, and we will be getting uh, the exact flyer out with, with those panelists very shortly. So very excited um, about that. And again, thank you for joining us. And we will make this posting um, available online. So thank you very much.